opening our service today. There is about seven of us in this place, and there's many of you out there, and God is with us. God is for us, and God is in us. Welcome to this message, which I have entitled Pentecost Triple Play. A little bit of baseball fans out there might kind of uh, appreciate that little nod, but I want to actually unpack an idea about what this Pentecost Sunday is about, and I'm approaching it in a little different way than you might typically hear, and uh, that's typical of me doing something untypical probably, but I want to just outline something right at the very beginning. As we look at his word, recognize that the Spirit of God is at work to empower us as we understand his word, as we live his word, because today my desire in preaching this is that you wouldn't hear a good message, but that you would be able to live a good message afterwards. Not just hearers, but doers of the word. Now, if we see the work of the Holy Spirit throughout all scripture from the very beginning of Genesis right to the end of the book, we see the work of the Spirit always present throughout all of scripture. So it's not a very strange idea to have a focus on the third part of the Trinity, or the first part of the Trinity, second part of the Trinity. I'm not sure exactly where the Holy Spirit fits in the Trinity, but they're all in one. And next week on Trinity Sunday, we'll actually unpack that full idea. But today we're focusing on the impact of Pentecost, the birth of the church. This is when it all began for us. I know maybe the first disciples didn't think that we'd be on video live streaming as the church continues, but here we are. God knew. He's not surprised by this, so glad that you're with us today. Here's what's really interesting, especially specifically in the day that we live in today. The work of the Holy Spirit, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, for the most part, comes to us to empower us to be witnesses, and that's in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But we see that it's just like the early church, and the church today, I think that there's great opposition and criticism of the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. And I think that we can't even be the church without the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome the criticism, to overcome the cynicism in our world today, and much of that opposition. But as in the early church, as we find ourselves in 2021, we need, there's no personal gain for us in this, we need the Holy Spirit to motivate us to be that kind of a witness. So let me put this on the screen as we launch in today's message. When the Holy Spirit is working, people are loved, people are saved, people are healed, and people are delivered from Satan's grip. All of these wonderful things that the Holy Spirit does for us, in us, and with us. Amen? Acts chapter 2 I'm going to actually read the entire verse 1 to 21, hopefully without any little side sermons as we go. But if you could turn with me in your Bible to Acts, we're going to look at the three purposes of Pentecost, and I call them the triple play, Pentecost triple play, and you'll see this in these verses. Verse 1, Acts chapter 2. On the day Pentecost was being fulfilled, all the disciples were gathered in one place. Verse 2, suddenly. Everybody say suddenly. Suddenly. All right, it's a surprising moment here. They heard the sound of a violent blast of wind rushing into the house from out of the heavenly realm. The roar of the wind was so overpowering, it was all anyone could bear. Then, all at once, a pillar of fire appeared before their eyes. Similar to the Old Testament, the pillar of fire that came to the people of Israel. Now, here in this moment, amazing. Let's continue. It separated into tongues of fire that engulfed each, of, each one of them. They were all filled and equipped, which is really key here, filled and equipped, empowered, in other words, with the Holy Spirit, and were inspired to speak in tongues, empowered by the Spirit to speak in languages they had never learned. Amazing. Now let's look at verse 5. Now at that time, there were Jewish worshipers who had emigrated from many different lands to live in Jerusalem. When people of the city heard the roaring sound, crowds came to where it was coming from, stunned over what was happening. It's a phenomena, right? Stunned 
over what was happening because each one could hear the disciples speaking in his or her own language. Notice the emphasis here in this, this version of the Bible, his or her own language. Bewildered, they said to one another, aren't these all Galileans? So how is it that we hear them speaking in our own languages? Now I'm going to just take verse 9 and 10 and just kind of mash it together. And I'm, uh, these are my words, my verse 9 and 10 here. Uh, this is my translation, all right? We are from, this is from the original, Iran, Iraq, Mesopotamia, Syria, Judea, Turkey, North Coast, Asia, Egypt, Libya, Cyrene, Romans, Jews, Cretans, and Arabs. The known world had gathered in Jerusalem. Yet we hear them speaking, verse 11, back to the text, yet we hear them speaking of God's mighty wonders in our own dialects. They all stood there, dumbfounded and astonished, saying to one another, what is this phenomenon? We're agreeing with that. It's pretty spectacular. Verse 13. But others poked fun at them and said, they're just drunk on new wine. Peter stood up with the eleven apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, my fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. You need to clearly understand what's happening here. These people are not drunk like you think they are, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. This is the fulfillment of what was prophesied through the prophet Joel. See that in your Bible? This is a reference to an earlier text in Joel being fulfilled and demonstrated in this right here. For God says. Now, what does God say? Look at verse 17. This is what I will do in the last days. Now, let's just pause for a second. Back then, they're thinking it's the last days, but it's also written for these last days. Watch this carefully. I will pour out my spirit on everybody and cause your sons and daughters to prophesy. Who's waiting for sons and daughters to rise up and speak the word of the Lord? Come on. That's, I'm, that's my prayer. Do I have an amen out there? Amen. All right. And your young men will see visions, and your old men will experience dreams from God. I'm not sure which category I want to qualify myself in, but I'll take both of them at this point. This is beautiful. Verse 18. The Holy Spirit will come upon all. Everybody say all. All my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. I will reveal startling signs and wonders in the sky above and mighty miracles on earth below. Blood and fire and the pillars of cloud will appear. Wow. Verse 20. Now the sun will be turned back, dark, will be turned dark, and the moon blood red before the great and awesome appearance of the day of the Lord. All the way till Jesus comes back. God's going to pour out his spirit. Verse 21. Would you read this with me? If it's on the screen, you can see it. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What a powerful text. Thank you for letting me read all of those verses in this one idea because I really want to share three main thoughts from this, but you need the full context. Um, let me just tell you a little story. Perhaps you, you've heard of this old story. I'm not quite sure. Um, but the vicar, uh, with Anglican, Catholic, you know, head priest, sort of speak, the vicar who was visiting a primary school where they were learning the Apostles' Creed. The children lined up for the vicar one at a time. They each recited the section that they had memorized to make an impression on the visiting vicar. However, an embarrassing silence enveloped the proceedings partway through. Eventually, one child blurted out as an explanation, I'm sorry, the boy who believes in the Holy Spirit is not here today. <laughs> oh, sometimes there's an embarrassing silence in the church when it comes to the Holy Spirit. I think the heart of God is actually grieved. So Pentecost Sunday, let it not be the only Sunday that we make an emphasis on the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. And I believe in some churches they might even ignore this completely, which is actually quite sad. Possibly, it's been said that Catholics believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Mother. Protestants believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Bible. Come on, how many people know it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? Francis Chan writes in his book, which is a great book, The Forgotten God, he writes about the work of the Holy Spirit in modern times, and that book, The Forgotten God, focused on the Holy Spirit. He said the talk of the Holy Spirit is absent or silent in many churches, and it grieves the heart of God. 
Now, the reasons for embarrassed silence, I believe, and there are many reasons, but I think the main reason would probably be fear. Fear of the Holy Spirit or fear of extremes when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Or, you know, the Holy Spirit, the older language is the Holy Ghost. How many people know ghosts are a little spooky? So maybe people think that the Holy Ghost is something to be terrified of. But I'll tell you, when you look at the Word of God, hovering over the face of the deep at our creation. Wow, it's powerful. And then the Spirit of the Lord coming upon His people over and over again. Nothing to be frightened of, nothing to be upset about. But in Acts chapter 2, some people take highlight or, or take, take this and think this strange phenomena of uh, earth, wind, and fire. No, sorry, noise, wind, and fire. And then speaking of other tongues, everybody just loses it and thinking, oh my goodness, this pastor is going to go crazy here talking about things that will really upset me everybody we're good it's okay as a result because of that fear i think what we end up doing is we don't emphasize the work of the spirit or we domesticate the holy spirit the holy spirit's part of the family the trinity but we treat him more like a pet as opposed to our guide and counselor and comforter and the great empowering force of god in our lives so let's not treat God and dismiss the forgotten God as a pet that we invite in and pet once in a while. Oh, yes, there's the Holy Spirit. No, no, no. He is the all-encompassing work of God in our lives. Another good place to say amen if you want. What a tragedy that would be to ignore the great work of the Holy Spirit. So as I talk to you, to you today about the triple play of the work of the Holy Spirit, the Pentecost triple play. I want you to write some notes because here's uh, the point number one. In a triple play, by the way, so I'm going to give you a little example. There's a guy on the screen, and it is actually recorded that he is the first person to ever get a triple play by himself, the first ever solo triple play. For those baseball fans, know exactly that is a phenomena, uh, which is really remarkable. But a triple play is when you get three outs in a row on one play. In other words, nobody need, nobody's out, and then one play, and everybody is out. The goal of my message today is to get us out. Not disqualified, but out to what God has called us to do. To get us out from the places that we've hide ourselves. To get us out from the, the idea of what we think God wants to do in our lives. To break us out in Jesus' name. To break through in our lives and send us out with his presence into a lost and dying world. Hallelujah. So here's number one. Pentecost, the goal of Pentecost, is to make us more like Jesus. That's what happened in Acts chapter 2. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they went out publicly to minister. See, some of the background on this, that if you don't know your Bibles that well, uh, Luke's gospel and Acts was written by the same author, obviously, Dr. Luke. Now, the Acts of the Apostles and the gospel of Luke is very similar in some ways. Paul, by the way, wrote more letters than Luke did, but actually for volume and word count, Luke actually produced more words in the New Testament than any other author, with Luke and Acts combined. I think this is amazing. Both, both Luke wrote uh, to Theophilus in Luke and in Acts, and I always wonder, Theophilus, who's Theophilus? We hear him, Luke introduce him, but can, I, can you do me a little favor? Can we play with his name for a second? So Theophilus is T-H-E-O, Phil, us. Theo meaning God. Let's just play in English here a little bit. Won't work in any other language, but God, fill us. Theophilus, God, fill us. Are we okay with this? You, you think I'm going? Okay, we'll, we'll move right along here. So Luke's gospel describes the incredible things that Jesus began to do and teach, it says. And by implications, Acts is part two of the work of Jesus in our world. Acts is Jesus still at work, but now through the power of his spirit that he is working through the church. In particular, the parallels in Luke and Acts is incredible. Between some of the early episodes in Luke's gospel, after the incarnation, obviously, we see the beginnings of, of Acts, the church following the similar steps that Luke describes Jesus followed. Both contain a promise that his disciples will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, 
that's both explained very clearly. Then the Spirit comes down upon Jesus at his baptism, and the Spirit comes down upon the, the disciples in the upper room in Acts, and the disciples there at Pentecost begin their ministry, like Jesus after his baptism then begins his ministry. Isn't that interesting? And after that, there's a key sermon by both of them. So Jesus preaches, and a, a great message, if you'll see that in Luke chapter 3, it's powerful. And then we see Peter preaching in Jerusalem. So Jesus preaches in Nazareth, impact. Peter preaches in Jerusalem, great impact. After the great outpouring, as a witness to all those who would listen. So you put all that together. I'm going somewhere with this. What is Luke telling us? He's showing us the disciples are following in the steps of Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit will do for you. He, he, the Holy Spirit will make you more like Jesus. So really, the work of the Spirit is about transformation, to be more like Christ. Or I'm going to say this, to be more like Jesus, Jesus-like. Now, we've heard the term Christ-like, but I'm going to use Jesus-like because Jesus was here on the earth fulfilling the plan and purposes of God like we are now the body of Christ. We are his representation on the earth fulfilling what Jesus started. Amen? This is good. I think it's good. Luke's telling Theophilus and us that the Holy Spirit has come in order to make us Jesus-like. Hallelujah. Now, often, we often lament, and I don't know about you, maybe it's just me, my wife and I chat about this sometimes, that we don't feel like we're anything like Jesus at all. I don't know if you struggle with that, that when you compare yourself to Jesus, you think, man, we really fall short. Exactly. That's the point. The fact that you recognize you're nothing like Jesus means you need him. Your failures, your failings, whatever it is, flaws, all is a reminder that you're still in need of a Savior. Hallelujah. We're never going to be perfect until we pass from this life into glory and we will be perfected. Quite, quite frankly, and, and frequently, I'd guess, we would wrestle with this idea that, we're, that there's a vast difference between how Jesus lived and how we live on this earth. So, what failing, I'll ask this question, what failing or what hindrance or flaw would be magnified when you consider these ideas? Is it possible that you, unlike Jesus, that you struggle showing love showing being selfless or sacrificial love the holy spirit is here to move us closer to the example of our savior number one. Second thing if god's transforming us to be like jesus through the power of the holy spirit second thing is is it we lack the assurance that our prayers are heard and answered that's another big struggle for all of us is god really listening is my prayer really going to be answered so then the Holy Spirit not only makes us more like Jesus, but also the Holy Spirit comes, listen to this, to move us in the right direction so that actually our prayers come in line with God's will for us. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He guides us and teaches us even our prayer life so that we begin to pray more prayers like Jesus prayed rather than just praying for the things that we want and need. How many people know that's maturity and growth? The other third thing is, do we lack courage to share God's love with our neighbors? I'm working up my courage right now. Moved to a new neighborhood, as many of you know. And uh, although we've met the neighbors to the north of us, we just met the neighbors to the south of us. So we're thinking about praying about how are we going to reach these uniquely different neighbors across the street, all around. We're starting to, you know, do the friendly wave across the streets and recycling day you know it's all hey how's it going and people are having their barbecues all out in front because we don't have backyards yet uh and it's kind of interesting season all of that is lord give me the courage because i need it too it's not just you give me the courage lord to share your love with those around me i don't know about you i'm asking the holy spirit to come upon me to remake me so i can bear the image of christ well to those around me how many people know those would be three great things we'd want God to change in us, okay? Let me put it another way to underline this point. Many Jewish people celebrated Pentecost every year in Jerusalem. It was part of the Feast of Weeks, or the, the Feast of the First Fruits, as a commemoration when God gave his, 
his people, people of Israel, the law at Mount Sinai. It's a significant moment in history. Can I tell you that there are significant feasts and festivals throughout the year that maybe there are opportunities like this long weekend, you know, God bless the queen, uh, whatever we're going to do this weekend, or fireworks, mostly I think it's all about fireworks. Um, but God gave the law, and the people had these celebrations because they were delivered out of Egypt, and they marveled at what God had done for them. So they decided to have a celebration. I think the church needs to celebrate more. I think we need to throw the best parties. I think when people think of the church, they think, man, those people know how to party. They know what life is all about, and they're celebrating. How many people think it's time for the church to show our best side? Hallelujah. And show that we've been delivered, and it's great to be free. We don't have to party like the world parties. We've got joy unspeakable and full of glory. We've got a love that abounds. We've got peace like a river flowing through us. How many people know what the world's really looking for? It's not some worldly, empty party, but life. Let's be the church that declares life. Israel loved to celebrate this feast specifically. And isn't that a perfect time for, the, for God to send the Holy Spirit on Pentecost as a great celebration? It was one of the greatest celebrations they had together as the people of God. Deliverance from Egypt out of our sins. Wouldn't it be great if our testimonies, people go, man, they're nothing like the world. Egypt represents the world. They don't look anything like the world. And man, they know how to celebrate good things things life together filled with delight wouldn't that be a great testimony man that person i look at them and they're follower of jesus and they are filled with delight hallelujah to be more like jesus and the power of the holy spirit's there for us to do that second part of the triple play the second out that we're going to have here is that pentecost is a taste of god's kingdom god's kingdom come yes not just when we get to heaven but also god's kingdom come on earth let me introduce this illustration uh this thought with an illustration so how many people pre-pandemic will go there or they're post-pandemic not during pandemic you ever go to costco now man it just feels like you're in a you know uh, it's it's not a pleasant experience but pre-pandemic how many people love the sample tables they're everywhere right how many people went at lunchtime because you just didn't have enough money and you thought i'm going to costco for lunch today and you get enough samples, by the time you're out of there, you're, you're good to go. And uh, it's funny how you would try a sample some things, and they're pierogies. Like, I don't know, they're like from another world, those pierogies there. And it was like, you end up buying their pierogies. And even though you didn't go to Costco for pierogies, you end up walking out with a, you know, cartload of pierogies. And it's just because you tasted how good they were. I don't know if they do something special try them at home and it doesn't feel like it tastes like at costco i don't know about you but that's kind of the kind of the deal but the reality is wow i bought something i sampled maybe this is what the holy spirit is trying to do for the church is that we become the sample of the kingdom of god now it's not meat nor drink like the samples at costco not meat nor drink but righteousness peace and joy in the holy ghost that's the kingdom of god in the holy ghost See, the Holy Spirit's there to reveal the kingdom of God. Righteousness, right standing before God and others. Righteousness, peace. Romans 14, 7, 14 17. Righteousness, peace, and joy, not in ourselves, but in the Holy Ghost. Isn't that a beautiful sample that we could offer the world? What a beautiful beautiful thing. I'll just give you another quick example. I remember we lived on a farm, and uh, there would be people who would, would be amazed at the variety of the types of apples, and I don't know if you've ever been to Food Basics or Sobeys. I know uh, <laughs> Abe works at Sobeys. We'll pick on Sobeys. Abe, I don't know what department you work in, but if somebody went to the fruit and vegetable section, and they started sampling things, they would probably get kicked out, I would imagine. Yes, not a good idea to go into Sobeys and sample the different apples, right? So, but my dad was different. He actually, when people said, oh, I've never had one of these, try one. He'd just give, you know, polish it up, give them a nice apple, and they'd be eating an apple, and then they'd try another one. I always looked at my, what in the world is he doing? Next thing you know, they're buying three bushels of apples from all the different samples that they tried. My dad was actually a smart marketer, giving free samples away. Maybe the church needs to be about giving free samples away of the goodness of God of the delicious fruit of the spirit Woo! wouldn't that be amazing that's what the holy spirit does that we become samples of the kingdom of god 
That is the reason why Pentecost is so important. The church is empowered to demonstrate the fruit of the... I'm getting really excited here. I don't know about you if you can feel it or not, but this idea really excites me. Glory to God. So we want to inspire people. Why don't we inspire them with the beautiful work of the Holy Spirit working in our lives? Here's some ideas of where that might happen. The Holy Spirit inspires us to care for the stranger. Isn't that a demonstration of the goodness and fruitfulness of God? We taste God's future. People taste God's future when we're kind to the poor, the stranger, those who are in prison, those who are naked. All those things Jesus said, you do these things, you do it unto me. It's a beautiful thing. When the Spirit calls some of us out of the darkness of sin and our testimony is a glory to God and it's a light to others to see the beautiful flavors of God that the kingdom uh, demonstrates to us when the same spirit does a work of healing in somebody's life what a testimony of the goodness of God it, healing of in life whether it be physical or emotional or social or spiritual exactly beautiful ways that God wants to heal us we glimpse the glorious future of the kingdom of God. It's a wonderful thing. Or, how about this, when the Spirit leads God's people to confront evil powers. We can't do that in our own strength. But the Holy Spirit in us can give us a prophetic word of truth and justice for the moment, that we can declare what God says according to his word, and we taste and see the sample of the new society that God wants in the world today. Hallelujah. Man. Last one right here is when the Holy Spirit does a supreme work of revealing Jesus to other people through our testimony, even if we don't use words. We get a flavor of all that is to come. Isn't that a beautiful thing? All right. Third thing, because i got to move along here. I see my, I'm running out of time because I want to land on this third tr part of the triple play. The third out in our triple play I'm going to need some water for this because I'm feeling the fire of the Holy Spirit. I'm about to see some steam in a minute. Watch this. Whew. Even though I take it, now this is really important here, Pentecost is about mission. It really is. Not just the launching of the church, but it's the launching of the idea of mission. Missions. Even though I take the disciples spoke to the crowd in their own tongues, but rather the crowd overheard them speaking in their own tongues. There's a difference here, and I'll explain that. What is really clear is the crowd overheard them. The Holy Spirit did a work that had nothing to do with the disciples. God moved sovereignly, an incredible moment. Fire, noise, all that stuff. And even the work of the Spirit, where there was a demonstration of tongues like that of fire, landed upon them. What is clear, though, is that the Holy Spirit crossed national, international, cultural boundaries by this incredible work of His Spirit. So people are hearing others praising God in their own languages. Now let me just back up a little bit. Now, on one level, there's something almost unnecessary about this. And let me explain. It is a tremendous miracle, and we know the end of the story, and then Peter preaches, and thousands, go ahead and say thousands, thousands, thousands of people come to Christ immediately. So there's something very unique here. Peter, who was a denier until he was filled with the Spirit, then was empowered in a great and mighty way, to do what God had called him to do. But the speaking in other tongues and other languages always was odd to me because although the Jews were from other lands, they would all understand the native language of that time being there gathered in Jerusalem or having their own translators if they were from a foreign land. But they were those who were localized for the Feast of Pentecost. And they would most commonly understand uh, Hebrew language, the language of their faith. Because it's talking about the Jews who heard, right? The Jews who heard. So why not just address them in Hebrew? This is my thoughts. Why wouldn't God just give them a, a prophetic declaration and preach a sermon? Why with all the languages? I'm glad you asked the question. The, the Holy Spirit takes the gospel to them 
in the language of each individual's culture. It's more than just words. Everyone is different. And the Holy Spirit knows how to reach into the heart of the uniqueness of everyone's personal culture, maybe even their heritage. How many people know certain heritage, certain nationalities? If you're from certain parts of the world, you respond differently to different things. Some things are a highlight to you. You ever been, oh, oh my goodness, I'm going to tell you, when I was in Jamaica for church, how many people know a Jamaican service is a lot more livelier than a church in England? Wow. Just different, unique culture. A lot of celebrate, a lot of clapping. I remember I was in El Salvador, and when they gathered for church, it was a whole day affair. It was like, you showed up, you brought your lunch, you got hungry, you sent your kids out, you fed them, you came back to church. Praise and worship was like two hours. Like, what is going on here? I haven't ever been to those kind of churches before, where every culture has a different way to express, and this is what's beautiful about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit knows how to express himself in every unique culture and identify this which is the good news of how established religion, by the way, says you need to be like us. You need to hear our language, our words, our ideas come to us, where mission is about we take Jesus by his presence to you. And that is the birthplace, not only of the church, but of mission. I, I'm going to say this. I don't think church and mission can ever be separated. I don't think that you can have church without mission. And I don't think you can have mission without church. They work together. You can't separate them. This is the birth of both of them. Isn't that a beautiful thing? So let's tear down the jargon. Let's tear down our religious words. Let's tear down the, the ways. Listen to me, especially in 2021, how we communicate the gospel to the culture that we live in today. We can't relate to 2021 like we did in 1951. 1981 right? How many people in 1981? You know, scripture and song, Maranatha, woo, praise little praise ditties. You'd sing like three lines 400 times. That won't work today, probably. How many people remember those songs? In fact, Alleluia is the only one that I just still remember. Think Alleluia. All I say is Alleluia like 120 times in a row, and it was amazing. No matter what happened, it was just a phenomenon. How many people remember that song? lyrics were amazing that slide remember back in the day where you had uh, acetate screens where you put it on would you put it on the overhead projector and it was just one word hallelujah and it worked but how do people know today's language the young people particularly they don't really we sound like we're foreigners to them so we need the holy spirit to give us a language to speak so we can be on mission to reach all generations would you say all generations with me that's my heart, and I pray that's your heart here. So this is not what the Holy Spirit does, speak in one language and everybody hears, but the ministry of Jesus himself is incarnational through the Spirit. God did not send Jesus at a distance and say, I am God, worship me. No, he sent his Son in a babe, in our language, in flesh and blood. The Holy Spirit does the same thing. He sends us incarnationally, that is the true way to do mission, by the ways. That is our great challenge at Bethany. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we shall not simply want to make more people like us. Our desire is to make more people like Jesus. Sorry about the sound there. I apologize. We shall establish new communities, new groups for new people. This is the way it is, and this is a beautiful thing with many cultures. How many people know in my neighborhood, I think there's probably at least a dozen different nationalities and cultures already. How about your neighborhood? Right? So if you only spoke English and everybody else around you spoke a different language, it'd be difficult to communicate, correct? Let's look at how we communicate God's love to a world. Every nation, tribe, and tongue in Jesus' name. We need new tongues to reach a new generation. I'll leave it at that. So we should expect Jesus' followers, A, who want the Holy Spirit, invite the Holy Spirit to fill us, God fill us, Theophilus, God fill us with your Spirit, so that we can, A, be transformed to be like Jesus. That's the first out. Second out is that we actually reveal the kingdom of God. 
we get out there and give and be the sample of God's kingdom to our world. Hallelujah. And the third thing is that we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, we are on mission together. So get out of your comfort zone. God's about to take us on a journey to reach the world, to get out there and do what he's called us to do, to be the church. The come and see days are gone. It's the go and show and tell is here, not come and see. Hallelujah. So in conclusion, we have every reason to welcome the Holy Spirit, not to be afraid of the Holy Spirit, to fill Bethany. Hallelujah. That's my prayer. How about yours? Would you agree with me? Rather than fear what the Spirit can do, we invite what the Spirit can do. Who wants to be more like Jesus? I see that hand. Let's welcome the Holy Spirit. Lord, we want to be more like you. Hallelujah. Who's hungry for a taste of God's kingdom on earth in this season? Come on. So let's pray. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and use us, Lord. Fill us and use us. Hallelujah. And demonstrate your kingdom through us. And lastly, who wants to share the love of Christ in a world that is both in word and in deed in a world that is great and needy? Anybody out there? That's your desire. So come, Holy Spirit. You're already at work in us. You're already working in us. You're within us. You're for us. Hallelujah. Use us now, we pray, in Jesus' name. Let's seek more of the firepower of God. And I'm going to say this, and in Jesus' name, get out there. You're out. Get out. That's the Holy Spirit triple play. No more hiding behind home plate. Home plate. No more hiding behind all those places. How many people wait, can't wait till COVID get over and we can actually get out there and do some things for God? Hallelujah. Amen. More than just the potlucks, we want to do some great and wonderful things for God's glory. So pray this prayer with me. It's four words. Yes, come Holy Spirit. That's the four words. Would you pray together with me? Yes, come Holy Spirit. One more time. Yes, come Holy Spirit. Amen.